Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on the potential of offshore renewables in Cornwall. Uh, my name is Ben Thomas, I'm the Cornwall representative of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Devon and Cornwall Area Committee and the, that person in. the Institution of Mechanical Engineers is an independent professional association that represents mechanical engineers and the engineering profession in the UK and specifically the Devon and Cornwall area um, and our committee provide a local hub for the IMOT key to provide support to local engineers and particularly those working towards professional registration so EngTech incorporated charter um, chartership and also to promote and celebrate engineering within Devon and Cornwall um, so with us this evening we have Alfie Wisdom who is a project development engineer and Kerry Hayes who is a project development manager um, from Simply Blue Group and they've kindly offered to deliver this webinar tonight Simply Blue Group are headquartered in Cork in Ireland and they've got offices based in Newquay in Cornwall and they're a leading blue economy uh, developer focused, focused on replacing fossil fuels with clean ocean energy by developing pioneering projects in floating offshore wind, wave energy and low impact aquaculture. So as a company at the forefront of Cornwall's offshore future, Simply Blue Group are going to be talking a bit about the potential of offshore renewables to not only accelerate the transition to a green economy, but to bring a wave of industry, innovation and supply chain opportunities to the county. Um, so Alfie and Kerry are going to start off by delivering a presentation um, and then afterwards we're going to have plenty of opportunity um, for a bit of Q&A. Um, so if you could leave all your questions to the end and then we can uh, work through them. Uh, just to let you know, we're going to be recording this webinar, um, including the Q&A at the end. But if you and we'll probably be distributing on our social media um, afterwards. So if you would rather um, any part where you might feature in it, you weren't included in that. Um, if you just send um, either uh, us an email um, with the IMAC email address, um, which will be on the last slide of the presentation, or just at some point during the webinar, if you just put the message in the chat, um, we can make sure that you won't be included in any of that. So if there's no questions, um, I'd like to hand over to Kerry and Alfie, who will be delivering the presentation. Perfect, thanks, Ben. So, just one minute. Oh, great start. <laughs> Having technical difficulties, despite the fact we weren't literally 30 seconds ago. There we go, perfect. Um, thanks very much, uh, Ben, for that introduction. As you said, um, I work for Simply Blue Group. My name is Kerry Hayes, and for myself and Alfie, are just going to talk through um, sort of a uh, bit of a skip through what it is that we do as a company and as individuals, um, where we see the potential for floating offshore wind and other opportunities in the in the Cornwall and um, wider Celtic Sea area, actually, not just within Cornwall. And um, yeah, as you said, there'll be plenty of time for question and answers at the end. So. Who are Simply Blue Group? I don't know, first of all, we're going to start with who we are. So um, I'm Kerry Hayes, Project Development Manager. I've only been in the company since um, August last year. That should say 2021. Um, I've got, I'm not an engineer. I've got a BSc in Ocean Science from the University of Plymouth and then a Master's in Marine Renewables from the University of Plymouth as well. And my focus at the Simply Blue Group is on the commercial scale development of projects um, that we're looking at at the moment. Um, it also says on there that I'm the policy engagement manager for the Blue Gem Wind portfolio and we'll explain a little bit more about what Blue Gem Wind is in a moment um, but that's a sort of secondary role I hold within the company. Alfie do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah certainly so hi all my name is Alfie Wisdom I am a senior project development engineer uh, based in the in SPG's Newquay, Newquay office. Uh, I have a Bachelor's uh, from from Ireland in mechanical engineering, so uh, among peers here, and I also have a master's in uh, sustainable energy from uh, the Technical University of Denmark. So uh, I've actually been with the company a little bit longer than Kerry. I joined in September 2019. Um, I've seen some of the the birth of uh, some of our projects and uh, have been with the company since it really started ramping up, um, which I'm quite proud of. Um, I am the delivery manager, so 100% of my time is spent on uh, the two Blue Gem projects, with, um, one of them being Valors, and then the, I'm also the electrical grid and um, geoscience package support for the Erebus offshore wind farm. Perfect, thanks Alfie. Just a little bit about Simply Blue Group then before we delve too much into the detail on our projects. Um, so we are, as Ben said, a blue economy developer 
and essentially what that means is that we want to work with the oceans to sort of transform our futures um, using all sorts of different mechanisms for more sustainable projects so that people can actually benefit from the oceans um, in in every sense of the word so it's just there on the right you can see our values which I, I won't read through but they are sort of at the core of everything we do with our project development we see ourselves as a, a responsible developer that really does try and work with the local community to ensure the best result for everyone um, we act with integrity all of those other good things there so as I say I won't read through them one by one but that's sort of how we what underpins our working practice so we're an early stage developer so why that what I mean is we do the early stage work so we do all of the sort of um, the groundwork on our projects we, we embed ourselves in the local community we um, do all of the for floating wind all the kind of pre-lease activities there and we find joint venture partners to support us and help us deliver our projects through um, as you can see there it says we do floating wind wave aquaculture and then the deeper blue economy um, and that's all sorts of different bits that I absolutely don't get involved with at all on the deeper blue at this point so I couldn't possibly talk about what we're doing there but we've got a variety of different offices worldwide and I think on top of that since this slide was produced I think we've announced at least two others um, that, that are added to that list. But Alfie and I are both focused on the, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear office, and we work entirely on the Celtic Sea, so we won't be touching too much on any of the other offices and, and um, areas in which we work, but we have got quite a broad geographic spread now. Um, this is also now ever so slightly updated. It says that we've got 67 people, and when I checked just before we did this, we've now hit the 80 mark. Um, when I joined last summer, I think I was employee number 46. Um, Alfie joined sort of 18 months before me and was employee number three. So we've grown at quite um, quite a remarkable rate over the last couple of years. Um, most of us are working, I think, on floating wind across the company, spread across the various different geographies. But we do have teams working, as we said, on our aquaculture and wave energy. And um, just on the right there, this sort of the, our approach to working. So I said we work in partnership. We, we form, I'll explain a bit more about our joint ventures in a moment, but we form partners with strategic people who can help us, partnerships rather, with strategic people who can help us achieve our goals. Um, and we really are focused on sort of managing stakeholder relationships and um, trying to design at risk as much as possible in all of our projects. We've got over, as I said, most of us are working in floating wind, so we've got a part, we've got a pipeline of over 10 gigawatts of projects now. Again, that probably is slightly greater than it was when this was produced, given our um, ever expanding uh, um, rate at the moment. Um, we've got a number of different partners, which I'll speak to now. As you can see that we've got, oops, skipped on. we've got a number of partners. The one that Alfie and I are both, both in Involved with heavily is the one with Total Energies. So that's what makes up our Blue Gem Wind portfolio. And you'll hear us refer to that a lot throughout the next however long we've got. But we also have partnerships with Shell. So our Irish projects, so marked there by Western Star and Emerald, they're both um, joint ventures with Shell. We've got the Salamander project up there, which is a partnership with Orsted and Subsea 7. Um, and then that Long Lock Salmon one there we've got is our low impact aquaculture. Uh, project there, which we've also got a number of other partners on there. So Erebus and Valorous are the two projects that form the uh, the Blue Gem Wind partnership with Total Energy. Alfie, I'm going to pass on to you to talk about this bit. So I'll control your own slides and have to direct me. No worries, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so the technology opportunity um, what I'll run through quickly is the is the overall uh, reason of why we're we're, fo we're following the different technologies and then dive into the projects a little more. So when we talk about floating offshore wind or flow, uh, we're talking about uh, essentially floating floating structures. So we're not looking at fixed sites, be it monopiles or jacket um, foundation for, for wind turbines. We're looking for semi submersible spars or um, uh, tension lake platforms, TLPs. So when we look at the UK um, over on the right hand side, we can see where the majority of the, the projects um, have been have been placed to date. Um, we have the, the major sites are all fixed wind. We have Dogger Bank off, um, off the East Coast and we have some uh, some projects off off the off the west coast in, in near the Isle of Man and around, around Liverpool. Um, if we look up at the top right, we can see that there is two floating offshore wind projects. Now these are quite small at the moment. Uh, I believe it's high wind, which is around uh, the 30 megawatt point, and then King Carden around the 50. 
Um, so the, the the hope is that we can um, we can kind of bring wind into these uh, deeper water areas, which generally have higher uh, wind speeds as well. Um, though the conditions can be quite quite difficult, but uh, that's the technical challenge that we're trying to overcome. In terms of where we look, we look at the Celtic Sea, which is can be seen down on the, uh, the bottom left. Um, so the reason that we believe the Celtic Sea is quite important to, to build out as well as in the North Sea is that there's um, there's a there's a lack of correlation in the in in the wind speeds in the area. So it, it, the wind might be low, blowing one day in the Celtic Sea and not the not the same day in the North Sea. So it actually helps stabilize the grid and provide power at a more consistent rate. So if we move on to the next, I think we have a slide on uh, on on wave power. So this is another smaller area we're looking at at the moment. We don't have uh, as significant a pipeline currently um, as uh, as with our flow, but we are looking at wave for the complementary reason for complementary reasons. So wave uh, is, is a bit more predictable perhaps than wind, and it has been shown to offset um, wind quite well. So in days where the wind may not be blowing, we could still gain power from from wave. If you see in the top um, top right, there's a nice little diagram showing the different wave strengths. So off the um, off the east coast of the UK, it's it's a little bit calmer. The Celtic Sea and off the north north northwest coast of Scotland, it gets pretty hairy. Um, same as the west coast of Ireland. So uh, these these are areas we're all from, and it, it it's quite uh, quite uh, quite wavy. So um, hopefully, lots of energy there in the future. Yep. Sorry, I just realised we've um, been using Celtic Sea as if that's the term that everybody will be familiar with, but it might well not. So do you just want to um, just explain exactly which bits of the geography is Celtic Sea there? So Yeah, I, uh, I think we have a slide a little a later, on. later um, on. So yeah, I can, I can I'll, I will, I'll cover it when we get to the, the Blue Gem aspect, um, if, if that's right. Uh, so yeah, we're so it's 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 an untapped resource. Yeah, there's some te technology issues um, that we need to need to consider. Uh, in the next slide, um, we have a quick rundown of the of the one product we do have in our portfolio currently, Project Sertia, or Sertia, depending on how you how the how your Irishism is. Um, in terms of what we're looking to build, we're looking at a five megawatt array uh, in 2026. Now this would be the first uh, semi-commercial array in in the world. Uh, we would follow that up with an additional uh, 25 megawatts to hit the 30, 30 megawatt uh, target by 2028. Now, the, as I mentioned, there's a couple of technology considerations we have to get through. So we've partnered, um, we have a co collaboration agreement with uh, with Core Power, and we're looking at a couple of other providers as well to to determine the best way forward for this. It's early days, but we have a we have some ambitions for Wave. Uh, hopefully, we can reach the same levels as with our with our flow ambitions in the future. And the final point of the technology I wanted to touch on was our offshore hydrogen. So generally, when we're looking at our flow and our um, wave, we're talking about electrons and getting those to shore. Right now, it's all about decarbonizing the grid. But there will come a point that we need a, alternative fuels and things like that. And electricity isn't always the, the best way to, to export. So something we're looking at is um, projects further afield uh, beyond say um, 100 kilometers or more we're looking for uh, on-site produced hydrogen and um, in some in some areas we're also looking at uh, energy parks on shore um, and what what can be done to uh, to generate alternative alternative fuels be it hydrogen ammonia methanol the, these sort of things uh, synthetic fuels are also on the on the table as well so lots of exciting uh, topics here as Kerry mentioned this isn't my day to day so uh, I can't dive too much into it but it is part of our deeper our deeper blue um, economy section that uh, SPG is pursuing, and hopefully in the near future we might be able to give another webinar on uh, on those topics. Um, if we move on, then we begin to come to the, the Celtic Sea. Oh, sorry, this is the, the products we're working on. Apologies, um, jump, jumping one too far. Um, so, in terms of what the situation is in the UK at the moment. We have a lot of development on the East Coast and um, we can see some of the, the Scott Wind Round uh, sites that were up for lease as well up in the north, as well as the developed and developing sites uh, around, around the East Coast, um, East Anglia, up near Liverpool. And <clears throat> yeah, I think we, we have the West of Walney site up there as well. So lots of development in those areas. What you might see is there's a lack of development down in the bottom left. Now we'll get to the Celtic Sea in a second, but in the areas where we have a lot of wind development, there's been great investment in the local supply chains. There's been a great in, um, generation of local jobs, investment in local infrastructure, lots of training in the area, job creation, and certainly a generation of, of transferable skills. And this is something we want to try and bring through floating offshore wind 
um, and low carbon means into the Celtic Sea region. So on the next slide, I'll, I'll finally uh, explain what the Celtic Sea is. So the Celtic Sea, it's, it's an area between uh, Brittany, uh, Cornwall, Wales and Ireland. Uh, it doesn't include Scotland, unfortunately, but um, you can see to the north of it, there's the South George Channel. To the east, we have the English Channel. South, we have the Bay of Biscay and to the west and south, we have the, uh, the, Atl the Atlantic. So the Celtic Sea is, is this plot of land, um, primarily a split between um, Ireland and uh, the UK with a small portion uh, in France as well. So this is kind of our, our uh, sandbox, if you will. This is where we're trying to um, make, make as big an impact as possible in, in developing local infrastructure and projects. It's an area that hasn't seen the same investment as the East Coast. It hasn't had the same uh, in, in, developments from, from leasing rounds, uh, but hopefully that will be changing soon. What we have done as SBG, um, Simply Blue Group, we have found two sites uh, that, that we brought into joint venture with Total Energies. And together with Total Energies, we have created the um, project portfolio of Blue Gem Wind. So Blue Gem Wind is essentially responsible for developing the Erebus offshore wind project, which is a 98, up to up 98 megawatt, a 96 megawatt project and Valors, which is a, an early commercial scale 300 megawatt project. So these projects we've been progressing now, as I mentioned, since 2019, when we when we first um, found them through our heat mapping um, setup. The Erebus project we expect will be somewhere between uh, six and 10 turbines. The current expectation is seven. Um, that the, the turbine sizes will be around the, the, the 14 to 15 megawatt. Uh, range if we do do land on those seven turbines. So they're pretty, pretty large devices. Um, Erebus is quite a progressed project. We're currently in feed, uh, progressing well, and we're we're looking at our um, engineering procurement um, contracts at the moment for, for our later construction phases. We have a lease agreement in place, both for the, for the project and for our cable corridor in towards shore. Valorous is a, a little further behind um, due to its, its size and uh, what we call a, a stepping stone strategy to try and bring the region along slowly. So Valorous, um, as I mentioned, 300 megawatts, it'll be approximately somewhere between 18 and 36 turbines. Now it could be fewer. We we have to wait and see what uh, what kind of turbine sizes come out. Uh, turbines tend to get bigger every every couple of years and uh, that changes the overall parameters layout and um, arrangement of, of the project. So right now uh, the project has a grid connection agreed um, along with Erebus into, into Pembroke. Uh, we, are, we have undertaken some surveys, there's more to be completed uh, prior to our consent submission and we will be partaking in next year's Crown Estate uh, leasing round um, which will be focused on the Celtic Sea and delivering, delivering flow from the region. The two projects, our ambition is to have them delivered by 2030 to support the UK's one gigaw uh, sorry it's five gigawatts now of floating offshore wind um, by 2030. So hopefully we can we can take a chunk out of that, though certainly the ambition has grown and the projects haven't uh, haven't been able to uh, with that. We'll 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 hopefully have some commercial scale flow to to support that in the in the in the very near future. Um on to the next one then. Um so I was I was gonna yep, do if you want to jump into this perfect. I was just gonna You've, um, you've, you've touched on it, but I was just going to comment a little bit on the leasing round that we're approaching and just um, and apologies if, if everybody's up to speed on it. Um, so the way that uh, things work at the moment is that the Crown Estate have kind of got responsibility for the seabed in, in England and Wales and the Crown Estates and in Northern Ireland. So um, and the Crown Estate Scotland have got responsibility for the seabed in Scotland and they kind of act as essentially as a landlord. So they're responsible for, for giving up leases, as, as we've just said. So. We are um, heading into a four gigawatt leasing round, as Alfie just said, um, by the end of next year, the results of that will be known. And we're expecting there to be um, all of those projects that are awarded leases within that round to be built out by 2035. Um, the, there's going to be a different approach taken this time to, to the leasing round. So the plan level HRA is really important that they're cracking on with that now in order to try and facilitate quick deployment of of projects, so that's just looking at the cum cumulative impacts essentially of um, all of these projects on the on the area um, from an environmental perspective and also a stakeholder perspective there. And we're expecting the leases to be um, awarded um, for projects that are in that um, early commercial, that 300 megawatt uh, stage, which is the same as Valorous, and also for the, the commercial sort of gigawatt scale projects. Um, 
I think it's worth saying, Alfie mentioned that there's been less, much less investment and development within the Celtic Sea area and, and actually on the Western Seaboard more generally. And for you know the main reason for that is that the Celtic Sea is much deeper than the North Sea. So we haven't been um, attractive to or physic or sorry, technologically attractive, if you like, to um, fixed offshore wind just because of those more challenging conditions. So it's um, floating offshore wind is a fantastic opportunity for not only us to get some renewable electricity generated on our shores or off our shores, actually, probably should say, um, but to stimulate some of that investment in supply chain and industrialisation and all the sort of good things that have benefited um, other coastal regions, such as over in the Humber and Pearl um, and also around Scotland. So we can kind of now attract some of that down here. So it is a massive opportunity, as I say, not only for green electrons, but also for uh, jobs, innovation and skills. Um, I'll, I'll also add as well um, down there, the project is number, listed as number five. Um, You'll you'll see that the the wave hub, wave hub uh, formerly known as wave hub currently known as I believe twin hub, and um, so that's uh, another floating offshore wind farm. It's a slightly smaller scale, and I believe it has submitted a um, application to the um, revenue support scheme, the CFD scheme, in the UK. So I believe we're the the, the industry is waiting to hear uh, if they'll if they'll be awarded um, uh, revenue support around. I think I think it's around August this year, but uh, we're we're hoping that they. They can also bring some additional um, additional investment to the region and um, essentially, you know, be be one of many projects uh, that, that we we create jobs and skills and um, investment from. Yeah, absolutely, and the other three squares, numbers two to four, then or rectangles, if you will, they are um, other test and demo sites. So Erebus number one has got its 100 megawatt test and demonstration lease. The other three are subject to the HRA that I mentioned before, but they are essentially now have got some site um, exclusivity there. So they are also hoping to, to come in and contribute to that target of five gigawatts. And um, Alfie said originally one gigawatt and then corrected himself to five. That's because as part of the energy security strategy that came out um, as quite a knee jerk response to um, the situation, the ongoing situation in the Ukraine, um, the UK government increased our target. So we had got um, the intention or the target to deploy across the UK one gigawatt of floating wind by 2030 and then that increased by a five <laughs> increased fivefold um, to five gigawatts by 2030. So it's a massive opportunity, but it's also a massive challenge for the region to uh, for the country really, but also for our region to, to be able to deliver in those time frames. As you'll have noticed from the slide Alfie did previously, um, it's still eight to ten years for project development to the for the project development time frame um, and leasing often comes part way through that, but until you've got the lease, there's um you are quite hindered as to how much work you can how how much progress you can make rather. So anyway, I will um, let you carry on, Alfie. Thank you, Gary. Um so I guess I don't know how many have actually seen the scale of these these turbines, but uh, I we wanted to show you this one to give you an idea of what we're actually trying to do with a single unit. So if you if you see the um I'm gonna butcher the Welsh name, but it's Cladau Bridge. Um, this is quite a large bridge for those of you that know Pembroke that leads from Pembroke Dock over to Milford Haven. Um, our turbine is, uh, you know, the, the the base of the hull nearly nearly gets up to up to the top of the bridge. These are large devices. You can see how large we are compared to even just a basic onshore two megawatt turbine. For those of you that's been on, that have been on the London Eye, if you get up to the top, you're still lower than someone who'll be standing on top of our our hubs for all the switch gears and the sorry the the, the 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 gear the, gear, the gears and the and the yaw are and the where the blades connect into. If you're in the shard and having a cup of tea up top, you'll just you'll you'll be just above where the very tip of our turbine is. So that just gives you an idea. That's one unit. We're trying to build seven, and that's a small project. If we talk about commercial sites, we're talking 50, 60 of these units. If we also compare the actual size from you know from from one end of the foundation to the other, they're about 100 meters long. So when we talk about needing decent port facilities, we need we need we need large areas and we need decent draft. So I, I believe the drafts are in the range of 10 to 10 to 14 meters when you're trying to connect the tower onto the foundation and around 60 meters or so when you're actually operational offshore for, for ballasting reasons. So these are these are huge devices and 
you know, it's not, I know skyscrapers tend to tend to sway. These things actually rotate quite, quite quickly. Um, we'll get onto the RPM in a minute, but they're, they're, they're not slow. I think tip speeds can be, they're, they're well in excess of, uh, of a hundred miles an hour out on the outer section. Oh, here we are. Yes. So, um, the, the size of them, I think can really be equated to the, the first point that a single rotation will, will power the house for two days. So that's all your kettles, it's all your phones, it's all your TVs, your vacuum cleaners, everything. You're, you're, you're talking about a lot of energy here. Um, in terms of when they can operate, the technology is getting better. The, 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 the kick in speed is currently around seven miles per hour, but it's, it is dropping. Um, the dropout speed, um, that's at 70 miles an hour. So the reason we need that is because if, if, we, if the turbines are going too quickly, um, they can break. Uh, they can damage the internal mechanisms and then you're, 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 you're in a world of trouble. So uh, what typically happens is the turbines um, will uh, stop, stop generating um, and so, and so the, the, the blades will just turn out to allow the air to pass over them without um, excessive speed and, 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 and force. Unfortunately, the generation then also drops off. But at, those at 70 miles an hour, you're talking about considerable storms that are, are relatively rare. So um, luckily we don't, we don't have too many of them. So the, the operational time of these, of the wind farms is generally um, I think we call it we, we we call it the capacity factor. The capacity factor of the floating offshore wind farms has been found to be quite high so far, um, above fifty percent of the time they, they're they're generating um, significant amounts of electricity. Um, then if we if we consider how much energy we're going to produce, how much green energy we're going to produce on these uh, these projects. So Erebus uh, being being a relatively small wind farm, it 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 will only produce energy to power around ninety three thousand homes per year. Um, I say only. Uh, given that in in Pembroke there is approximately fifty six thousand homes, so essentially Erebus will power the entire of Pembrokeshire with green energy for for a year. Um, there is grid balancing, and there will be times when there, the, the, the wind energy won't be flowing. But uh, hopefully in the future we can balance that out with a bit more a uh, bit more solar, a bit more wave, and uh, really really make a, a good well, well rounded green green grid. In terms of kind of where. Where in the project we we focus our design and where opportunities uh, for work can will will which we will eventually get to will come out of. Uh, um, <clears throat> we we obviously have all our design. Um, so if we look at the Holland mooring and floating structures, we have to design these. There's towing involved. So there's a lot of forces that are put onto the onto the foundation from the wind turbine. So our wind turbine and Holland mooring are, are generally one of our most important packages, given the dynamic nature of the of the of the structure and the need to to manage significant loads. Uh, you saw how tall they were. Were there's there's a significant amount of of torque and frequency that has to, that goes through these through, through these um through these units. We do a lot um, in terms of site layout and optimization, so we have a lot of considerations to make here in terms of the overall layout. One thing in particular that I always note, and uh, you, you'll see straight lines um, you know, of, of turbines. This is to, to support any search and rescue that has to be undertaken. So rather than having them spread all, out, all over the place in, in a big mess, we, we try to organize them in, them in neat rows so that vessels can pass um, easily through them. It's also um, Used for that then for for fishing and dredging so that they don't have to constantly uh, swerve in and out of out of uh, out of turbines. Um, our onshore substation, uh, offshore substation. Apologies. Um, I will touch on this one actually. I think there's some dynamic cable people in the audience. Um, so currently uh, we focus on projects that are within depths that can take a an offshore substation. So at the moment um, there are offshore floating substations. The problem is that with the increase in size of the of the of the of the projects up to 300 and beyond uh, megawatts, uh, the size of cable required gets larger. And unfortunately, the technology for dynamic cables isn't quite there yet. And um, there's a lot of research going into it, but unfortunately, the actual production is not uh, available yet. They are not um, uh, type tested and certified, so there, there's nothing currently on the market that would allow us to use a floating offshore substation. So that's why we have a fixed structure, but it is the only fixed structure you will find on site. Everything else is floating. 
Um, in terms of our cables, uh, so we, we we need significant lengths of cable. Airbus alone is approximately 50 kilometers, including both the offshore and onshore section. So it's a it's quite a significant amount of copper and raw materials and um, uh, go into these cables, not including the interarray cables, so the cables between the various turbines. These can be dynamic because the technology is available for the lower voltage cables that um, IAC, the interarray cables are. So in terms of um, the export cable, they tend to be much larger voltage because there's a lot more power going down them. As the interarray only go between turbines and substations, it's easier to um, keep the, keep them at a, at a, at a smaller rating. Um, we look quite a lot at the environmental aspects. So in terms of our offshore and onshore consents, where we're, we're, we do a lot of survey work, both uh, species based and environmental based. So we do we we, we take grab we go out and we take grab samples. We we use uh, sonar and scans to to map the seabed, see what kind of information we have um, for both habitat and design purposes in terms of our anchoring. Um, and onshore, we do we, we do we do a lot of investigation into um, both traffic management and looking at local species and uh, impacts on those. That all feeds into our overall planning permission and consent application. And in terms of landfall, uh, we're doing we're doing quite a lot of that recently to try and minimise overall impacts on on local stakeholders. Um, that you know re reduce the amount of time we need to close roads and you know Im impacts on the uh, lo local environment as well. Uh, we we do try our best uh, with SPG and, and Blue Gem to to minimise our overall impact on on the environment and um, local stakeholders where possible. Uh, you know we want to work with local groups rather than coming in and um, stomping all over the place. So then finally, in terms of our um, electrical, so we we obviously have to do quite a lot of electrical designs. Um, for for the overall project, so we we have a high demand for electrical engineers at the moment, which is uh, a bit of a bit of a bottleneck, I think, in the industry. There's quite a huge demand and lack of supply of of qualified personnel in in, in electrics. Um, and then the onshore, we 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 do need to take a, quite a bit of, of civil uh, civil work onshore, as I mentioned. Erebus is 50 kilometer co corridor. I think about 10 kilometer of that is um, onshore. So we'll be trenching and laying cables onshore. Um, Finally, then the grid. Uh, there's a lot of regulation that we need to follow, so our designs tend to tend to stick to those, and uh, we follow various regulations such as the SQSS and grid codes, and a lot of engagement with the local transmission operators to make sure everything is ready, so that when we build our uh, wind farm, it's ready to be plugged in and export our wonderful green energy. Um, so that was a yeah rattle around uh, to what the project looks like, and I suppose now that kind of leads into what are what are the jobs, and I think Kerry, you're going to take the first couple. Yes, Kessel. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Arthur. Um, just wanted to uh, some big numbers, um, and it's worth, I guess, um, saying some of these numbers. I, it, they're useful, but they're ever so slightly outdated. Um, but they give an indication, and they're predominantly focused on fixed offshore wind. So this is um, some data uh, from Renewable UK, who, if you're not familiar with, they're the industry trade body. Um, I also represent uh, Renewable UK as I'm chair of their shadow board, um, but they carry out regular um, assessments of workforce requirements, um, shortages, skills gaps, etc. And as of um, December 2020, there were you know, just over 26,000 people working in the UK floating offshore wind workforce. I've got a number in a moment which is a bit more up to date as to what they reckon we're going to need to have to get to 2030, and it's considerably more than that. Um, in terms of the ages of people that are working in the sector, I think again these are you know these are slightly more up to date than that. They're they're just over a year old, but there's a real spread between um, for all ages, which just I think goes to show there's opportunities at all stages of the project development phase. There's there's apprentice schemes and, and all sorts of other professional services roles, and I think all of those are represented in different age sort of categories. Um, I've never been known to do a presentation <laughs> about renewables without um bringing up the uh, the lack of gender balance within the sector. Um, you'll see that the, the greeny bluey bars are, are men and uh, the orange ones are female and that's split across the various different age profiles again. And you'll see that at every single age profile, uh, women are, uh, are represented far less significantly than men are. Um, I'm hopeful that floating wind is an opportunity for this to change actually because we're, we're starting from a fresh uh, particularly in the Celtic Sea, we're starting from a fresh slate, so we can try and uh, try and encourage some more women into the sector as we go. But it's um it's something that I think is a big problem, not least because again, when I get to the big number of 
people that we're going to need to get to by 100,000, uh, by 2030, I've just ruined the number. <laughs> we're going to need about 100,000 people to get to 2030 to get to that uh, five gigawatt target that um, Alfie mentioned a moment ago. And it's quite clear that we're not going to be able to do that based on the existing workforce. And we're not going to be able to do that by only engaging, you know, 50% of the population. So it's something I'm really passionate about trying to um, trying to do some work on. Um, Alfie, this is a you slide. I think my slides have gone slightly out. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so this uh, slide is to represent how much material we're going to need, what kind of cranes we're going to need, and what sort of um, time at ports we're going to need. So if we look at Erebus, Erebus is a, as I mentioned, a 96 megawatt project. Tons of steel and the, the lengths of cable might seem kind of large, but as we kind of start scaling that up 300 megawatts 500 megawatts we see we we, we, we you start to realize that even though Erebus is a, is a relatively small project it gives us an opportunity to produce a small amount of material and goods and and services to fill that gap and then it allows scaling uh, up to those 300 500 megawatt so that is what we call our stepping stone approach it allows the local in industry and and jobs to be created for smaller projects and grow then with the larger embedding learning and knowledge in the region and facilitating further growth and it at the at the bottom line is it, it keep keeps the money and jobs in the local region rather than having them necessarily go abroad um in terms of our crane capacity i want that one point to note on that that is currently based on i think possibly the g halliad x which is an 11 12 megawatt um turbine that's going to go up um it's it's pretty crazy the size of the turbines and where they're going in terms of port side assembly time again Erebus 15 days but we have weather downtime there's issues you know you need to get your your units into port so this is the amount of time by the key side working on the on it this will grow the more projects you have if you consider that that's maybe two days per unit um without weather downtime which could double or triple triple the amount of time by port uh, in the in the port so there's a significant amount of time that these these units are going to be port side and that means that if we want to achieve our, our targets we need more investment and, and larger ports really um the note on the right uh very quickly i want to want to touch on that that's um uh, oryx uh, when it looked at the first gigawatt for the celtic sea as kerry mentioned that target is now five so you know that's talking 15 15 000 jobs and a significant you know what's that over over a billion to uh well well over maybe two billion to 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 achieve that um now not all of that will come to wales and cornwall scotland scotland is looking quite quite significantly at flow as well but there's the opportunity there that in the future beyond the initial 2030 target there will be a great opportunity to expand that further again um and a lot of these a lot, a lot of these positions can be brought up and um, go, go abroad as well um the, the skills can be can be used in other countries so uh in terms of what the the original points I made on the steel and the cables uh, looks like um, local opportunities can and could include the likes of Tata steel creating 24,000 um, tons for us uh, in terms of the cables Prismian have a have a uh, a factory in Wrexham and um, you know we have rope we have um, we have anchors that have to all be created it was noted that for drag embedment which is generally the um, type of use which is basically they hook into the ground and you've got a got a line coming out of them um they cannot really be produced in in the region uh driven anchors are are more accessible uh, via companies like fugo and ldd um but at the moment drag embedment um there's a question of where, where exactly those will come from so it's it, these are opportunities you know we uh, um we, we like to think that for for local inf infrastructure and supply chain and jobs to be created to 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 support these in terms of project development phases, so right now our projects are in the development and design phase. Um, there's, as you can see, quite a low spend. Um, I think perhaps the second lowest after uh, just ahead of decommissioning. Um, the majority of the money will be spent when we're talking about manufacturing, assembling, and in installing these devices. There's also a significant amount of investment through O&M services. O&M is generally earmarked as one that is very easy to get into the local local region and um, so the, the hope is that you know we're talking about 74 long-term jobs uh by, by by 2030 through through the O&M if we're looking at um de development of design uh we a significant amount of jobs through consultants survey work 
you know, designers and of course ourselves, project managers and stakeholder, you know, stakeholder engagement of the actual development side. But you know, there's, there's a wider range of skill that we do need. Um, in terms of manufacturing, that is getting a little more difficult. Um, in in the UK, there's a lot of competition from from abroad, from Asia, in terms of the primary steel. But we're quite hopeful that cables and secondary steel, uh, it'll be possible to um, to kind of get the investment to start producing that in in a uh, bit closer to home. Um, also creates an opportunity then that that can be be exported. In terms of assembly, again, this is a port based activity, so there's a lot of hope that this can be. Um, done in the UK. Some investment is needed in the ports, certainly, uh, but long term, there, there's a significant amount of projects that are going to come through those ports. So we hope that it's something that that does get done. Um, finally, the installation. This is down to the EPC uh, en engineering procurement and con contractor rules. Um, so ideally, you know, there, there are some UK com UK based companies and hopefully there'll be more that'll be able to enter the market again with a smaller project. It's more feasible to to kind of take on the risk and the workload and the, the responsibilities. So there's a lot of a lot of different phases, a lot of different job opportunities, and there, there's a huge amount of skill sets. So I think we'll get onto that one and uh, that one next. Um, so in terms of. of the, I think. No worries. Um, so do you want to dive into this one, Kerry? Or? Yeah, so as I said um, previously, so by 2030, UK offshore wind is expected to employ about 100,000 people. So a significant increase on where we are today around that 26,000 point. That number is including floating offshore wind. And that um, I, this is a terrible photo because I took it off. Um, it was being presented at a, as an event and the report hasn't actually yet been released. So it March this year's figures. Um, and some of the areas where opportunities were identified as, as being um, lacking are just sort of captured there. So there's lots of different manufacturing engineering skills. There's um, innovation R&D skills required. Um, my favourite one is that actually we're going to need another 5,000 welders. And no one's quite sure where we're going to find those from at this point. Um, but just to sort of highlight some of the key areas there, and, and there will be many more. And actually, when this report that that awful photo is taken from is released, there's much greater depth and we're also expecting one to come out of the catapult soon which will also kind of identify in much greater detail some of those um, gaps and opportunities for the region a little bit further but um, just to share that one there and Alfie if we just skip through the last couple of slides quite quickly so we can get to the Q&A I think you can talk about this one you put this in <laughs> Yeah, I pop this one in. So this is this was an SPG uh, activity. We, we it's part of our educational program, uh, Roisin Renewables, and it's essentially trying to uh, educate the 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 the, the younger uh, generation in in terms of renewables and what's possible. Um, the the key point here is involved, and it's you're never too small to make a difference. You know, we're all trying to pull in the right direction, and there are certainly a lot of job opportunities out there, which um, we'll get into in the next next two slides. Um, in terms of overall industry, uh, we need a lot of scientists, a lot of people focus on the environment. You know, we want to build these, but we want to build them in the right way. We need ornithologists to look at our our bird, the bird species, and make sure that the impact isn't isn't too great. Same with the marine mammals. Uh, we need a lot of geologists to know that we can actually, you know, install our cables and bury them to the to the correct depths, and there's no thermal implications. In terms of, um, you know. Uh, delivering a lot of the surveys and people off offshore, we need skippers, boat crews, uh, we need crane operators. The you know, the the these are not necessarily jobs you might have thought of when you thought of wind, but certainly they're they're a major part of both the construction phases, the development phases, and the um, O and M phases. So they're across every part of it. Uh, in terms of welders, Kerry just touched on that. We need another five thousand welders. So um, th there's going to be no shortage of jobs, and the industry is only going to grow in the coming years. Twenty thirty is a small target. You know we're we're, we're, we've got great ambitions, not just ourselves, but but the industry as a whole, up to 2040 and on to 2050 to to meet our net zero targets. Um, in terms of kind of wider, um, more perhaps more general, um, uh, positions, you know, we need project managers and administrators. Uh, certainly, we need we need lawyers to understand the the regulations. Uh, uh, we need HSE coordinators to make sure we're doing everything in a safe manner that it that it protects both ourselves and the environment. Certainly, communications and PR is very important. We want to be able to make sure that we're talking uh, with stakeholders um, in a in, in in a manner that allows them their concerns to be addressed, and certainly our our visions to be you know 
um, uh, communicated to them in, a, in an effective manner. Uh, so that there's no confusion and everyone's on the same page. In terms of our team, so this is the Blue Gem team. We had a had a nice outing back in I want to say March in Pembroke. Yep. Uh, you can see we're all wearing jackets. It was a pretty chilly day. But just to give you an idea, this team alone, we've got project managers, we've got lawyers, doc controllers, we've got those focused on on policy and the stakeholders, a H C coordinator, certainly a lot of commercial and and contract focused people, financial accounting. You know, uh, PR and marketing. The, the, there's a whole range here. I think I've forgotten the environmental scientists, <laughs> engineers, but everyone knows that they're involved in. So it's the other jobs that people perhaps don't see, um, and certainly that's something we want to pass on. So, yeah, I think the last point we're leaving with is a, a lovely picture of us from last year in Ardmore, which I think has actually doubled now. You know, the the team has 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 grown quite a lot in the last while. So um, it's an exciting time, and who knows, maybe someday uh, we'll be seeing some of you. Some of you joining us, uh, we are always hiring, so uh, <laughs> keep an eye on our webpage, um, which I think, I don't know if you've seen it, it's simplybluegroup.com. So q and A's, I think, Ben, yeah? Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think just the, the scale of the opportunity to fill those 100,000 jobs is really exciting um, across everyone. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a few minutes left for a bit of a QA. and a So if you have a question, if you could either use the put your hands up uh, function in Teams or just chuck it in the chat if you can't figure out. Either of those just um, take yourself off mute. So yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, this is um, Alice. I'm here with Ryan. Um, I'm currently right. studying a um, master's in offshore renewable energy engineering at the University of Plymouth right now. And one of the things that we covered in one of our modules was the possible hybrid technology between the offshore wind and wave. And I was just curious if that could possibly apply to any projects that you guys might be doing in the future. Take that, Alfie, or do you want to? Uh, I, well, I, can I can touch on the technology if you'd like, Kerry, quickly. Um, so, so cur currently, uh, as, as you mentioned, it, it's not currently currently being uh, utilised. Um, a lot of the designs we look at are purely trying to um, uh, support the the turbine structure. When you when you Im include the additional uh, wave, I'm sure you know that things get a little more complicated. So, currently, the commercial scale is, uh, or the commercial vi commercially viable options are purely either wave uh, as a wave farm or, or um, wind. We have looked at co-locating them, so that would be a wave device beside a turbine uh, to kind of make, make maximum use of the site and reduce uh, kind of the sprawl of these, these areas. Um, but as, as a device, currently we haven't looked at them, but certainly uh, as they progress along their, um, their kind of their certification and getting, and getting proven and type tested, we're going to look at them a lot more closely. Yeah, I think um, we're well aware of the marine power systems projects as well, and talk to talk to that team a lot. And I think yeah, it's a um, it's certainly not something we would write off, but it, at the moment it's it's perhaps not quite ready with the the pace at which for our, you know, the projects that we're working on and the pace that they're progressing. But uh, we do talk to that team. I know that they're what they're probably the leaders in that space at the moment on the co-located technologies there. So it's certainly something that we're yeah that we're keeping an eye on. And um, pleased to hear this in Plymouth. Um, students out there who then I studied both my degrees at Plymouth and I now still um I come back and lecture every year on the um not the engineering course although I think I can't remember if they've changed the name but the offshore renewable energies course anyway yeah I was doing my I'm um, in the engineering side so I probably wouldn't have had a lecture from you no not unless you're on um, policy and um law <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. thank you thanks for your question uh, we've got Josh next um, what um, what ports are currently available to um, assemble the turbines, and what's the lifetime of the turbines that you're talking about? Alfie, if I take ports and you take lifetime. Uh, yeah, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's a good question, and I think um, there's a huge amount of work to be done around ports. Essentially, I think um, I wouldn't want to. Uh, speak out of turn I think but at the moment I'm not sure that there are very many ports around the Celtic Sea that are ready to do everything that would be required from larger projects so there's a huge amount of work going on at the moment to bring our ports up to um, up to scale um, we've, and we probably I'm now speaking out of turn but for many years we've sort of not invested in ports they've been privatised and then have had various different owners stru you know structures of own, own structures where they're owned and different levels of investment and I think there's now a bit of a rush for all the ports to do the things that Alfie said so deep waters big key sides lots of lay down space um along key sides rather 
Um, so I think there's a big rush coming now with everybody realising the opportunity that we've got and we're also recognising, the government are also recognising the need to sort of step in and support. So there's a £160 million fund out at the moment, which it sounds like a lot of money. It's not actually as much, not actually very much in, in terms of ports, um, but that's being uh, looked at at the moment, the best way to spend that to ensure that the ports are ready. Um, so I think it's probably fair to say, Alfie, that you know at the moment there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly around Celtic seaports, um, to just get them up to up to the stage they need to be at. But there's absolutely no shortage of appetite from the ports now. It's just a case of um, um, demonstrating that you know we, for us as developers to demonstrate the pipeline of projects that's coming through. There's a role there for the Crown Estate to play, at ensuring that we don't stop at this four gigawatt point that I mentioned earlier. That there's a continued life cycle. Of projects coming through there just to give that confidence um, and I don't think it's going to be very long until we see um, lots of ports able to play lots of different roles um, in these projects. So I suppose I'll touch on the lifetime. Um, so typically uh, we're, we're, we're targeting a similar lifetime as fixed, so 25 years uh, plus there's a potential 10-year uh, extension uh, when we, when we uh, uh, be beyond that. Um, that depends on our lease. Uh, I know with Erebus currently, I believe we're, we, we are looking at a 23 year lifetime at the moment. Um, now, the longest uh, installed wind farm in the world is, is High Wind. I believe it was around 2014. So that's been operational for, floating, for eight years now. Floating wind. Oh. Floating wind, sorry. Yes, float, floating wind. Uh, <laughs> apologies. High Wind off Scotland. Um, so they've been operational for about eight years. Um, so far, they're doing well. Kincardine is now installed. So it'll be interesting to see how, how the lifetime does does unfold. Um, certainly, this I've seen some research suggesting that actually the lifetimes could be longer, um, given the the significant amount of steel that goes into these structures. They're, they're actually quite, they are a lot sturdier than than perhaps they need to be for 25 years. So hopefully there might be a possibility to, to repower them, recertify them and get them back out there for longer. It is a certification issue at the end of the day. So uh, if we're only certified for 25 years, we can't leave it out there any longer. Otherwise, we're not we're not insured. Um, I, I want one point to add on the ports as well, um, just kind of on the scale of things. You know, we, we talk about the unit being a huge, huge aspect of it, the, 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 the weight of the hub that has to be lifted. Um, you need for a, for a GE Halliad X, uh, you would need, I think, the biggest crane in the world to be able to uh, to lift that up, to lift that up there. Um, ring cranes are an option, but then you need a lot more lay down space um, with the different crane uh, sizes and the different hub height weights. We're talking about more um, key side strength. So all of this needs to be investigated uh, as, you know, Cornwall and South Wales and, and Devon, they haven't had to do the large floating wind yet. This, this, uh, the, these are all checks that have to happen. The, the West Coast is currently better, better set up than us, but hopefully, as Gary said, with the investment and the, pr the proof that there is a lot of, pr there are a lot of produce coming down the line, we can, we can secure that investment and, and, and make sure the, the local infrastructure is, is capable and, and can, can supply the, uh, can supply the jobs and, and, um, uh, all the all the wind. Yeah, thanks for your question, Josh. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Got one, if not. Um, so I've got a question. Just it links back to ports, but just at the moment, are there any plans to utilise any Cornish ports or um, particular parts of the supply chain in Cornwall? Daphne, do you want to take that one, or do you want me to? Um, currently, everything's out for tender, so we would love to use um, as as much local infrastructure as possible. Uh, that will come down to uh, how the CFD process is plays out and how much um, what the, what the final cost will come down to. So at the moment, I can't confirm exactly, um, but certainly, you know, we're 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 local. We do try and use some local consultants, local survey groups. So in terms of our development, we have generally either been local or at the very least UK based. I think our number is at least 90% of our spend to date has been within the UK. Um, I can't give you the exact number for Cornwall, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> I think it's just worth, worth saying then, so Alpha mentions everything everything is out for tender, that's on this Erebus project, which is the most developed project. Um, the Valorous project and future projects that we'll be involved in, um, you know, there'll be varying different levels of local engagement, uh, d also depending on what, exactly where they're located. So Erebus and Valorous are both um, Welsh projects. So, you know, there's, there's been, like I say, quite a lot of focus over there, but um, Simply Blue Group is looking at commercial 
scale projects, which um, might well be located a little bit closer to Devon and Cornwall. And we'd, you know, again, be absolutely looking to to engage um, as many local supply chain companies as possible. And, and we already are working with lots of groups in Cornwall. And what I also would say there that there are lots and lots of developers now looking at this. So I think what's fair to say is that um, there's a piece of this for probably every local port and probably every local supply chain company that has got an appetite to get involved in these projects. Um, we said 100,000 jobs, a stupid amount of steel, <laughs> lots of components, that there's opportunities for, for everybody. And I hope that that's been really clear that, um, you know, within that four gigawatt and then there's nobody stopping their ambition at four gigawatt there, this, this continues out and there's a real opportunity for project uh, for companies and ports to kind of upskill and get ready and not only then make, um, not only they'll be able to service Celtic Sea projects, but then to benefit from a massive export opportunity as well, because, you know, most of the world's waters are deeper than that, that, that um, fixed wind can be installed in. So the skills and the um, expertise and the products that can be developed here will have uses across in you know in Ireland and, and broader out it into Europe as well. So there's um yeah there's plenty of opportunity. I think at the moment, like Alfie said, we're focusing on Erebus quite seriously. Those contracts are out for tender, and we'll be waiting to see what what the um, tender has come back with as to as to what that looks like. Brilliant. That's pretty exciting. Um, do you have time to? Uh, answer Ryan's question. Just one more. Yep, yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah, Ryan, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. So, just uh, a quick question about the um, public reaction to say offshore renewables. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there is a quite a bit of misconception that goes around about, let's say, offshore wind and how that might impede on, let's say, the local scenery and impact tourism, which is a big um, money maker, particularly down in Cornwall. So what would you do in order to reassure the public that it's not going to impede on any aspects like that and to uh, basically try and bring aspects that offshore renewables can bring to the county? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think it's a, it is a challenge, as you say, and I think, um, but I think broadly at the moment, all of the attitude trackers do show that most um, people actually do quite like offshore wind. So I think we're starting from a position that particularly given the cost of living crisis and, and various other things, people are actually much more favourable of renewables, including offshore wind. And offshore wind always has a better time than onshore wind because it is that bit further offshore. Um, so it's slightly less visible. So I think we're starting from a position of strength there. But in terms of what we do, I think, you know, developers, um, particularly responsible developers such as ourselves, we put a lot of work into our site selection work so that we can ensure that we are balancing our projects and, and with the local stakeholders, stakeholders including fisheries, shipping, other marine users, um, considering the environmental zones, and then also doing that work, you know, to make sure that from a visibility perspective, it's not going to damage the the tourism industry, and or at least won't give people that perception, so that we actually get time to then talk to them to to reassure them, and then it just comes down to good stakeholder engagement. To be honest, people are allowed to have differing opinions about it, and people have got a right to be heard and and to give us that opportunity to explain the benefits to them, um, and to to have those conversations. So I think we really pride ourselves on the quality of engagement that we do as developers. Um, once we've once we've you know strategically picked sites that are less um, impactful to the communities, to then just have that time to do that really good honest, open, local engagement and, and work out how we can best work together to develop the projects. Um, I think the other thing there is there's a role for people like the Crown Estate to play um, with working with some other stakeholders, uh, stakeholder groups I mentioned there, like fisheries and the shipping industry, for them to come together to try and smooth out some of the challenges. So it, it's not I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I think that um, because we're starting from a position of strength that people actually do quite like renewables, um, offshore wind farms or rather floating offshore wind farms are that little bit further offshore which means that they're by you know less visible and also in mostly in less um, environmentally sensitive areas so that certainly helps as well and I think then by just doing that really good stakeholder engagement and Alfie mentioned we really you know there's um, there is definitely opportunity for people in stakeholder engagement and comms to come into the sector to um, to carry out that work and, and that, that's the other reason that I think it's important that we are local developers and I think that we are embedded in our communities and that 
um, you know, you actually understand the areas that you're working with and, and the people that you're dealing with. And um, so I think that this, I don't know if that actually answers the question, it, but it is just kind of a case of really listening to people, good stakeholder engagement and doing as much as we can to benefit the environment at the local communities as we're going. So Alfie talked about our schools program, um, talk, you know, working with local companies, working with the local ports. People tend to like these things much more if they can see obvious benefits to to the local area. So we, we try and do as much of that as we can. And it's just best to say actually for the rest of our company, exactly the same practice is being carried out apart in other parts of the, uh, the world. So our Irish team are really active in that over in the projects around Western Star and Emerald as well, just to try and really build up very local um, local, local benefits to the to the projects. All good. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I appreciate that we've run over um, a little bit. Josh has another question. Do you have time to answer it now or? Um, I may point play as long direction? as Alfie, Alfie is. I know you've got something to rush to. Yeah, I've got to see a man about a dog, but I have about, have about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, go ahead then, Josh. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, just something you mentioned back at the start of the presentation about um, Simply Blue themselves um, and the sustainable aquaculture. What's your definition of sustainable aquaculture and what's the certification you use? Okay. Yeah, so, so, so unfortunately neither of us work in the aquaculture side, but from the, uh, so I, I probably can't answer on the certification side. I can answer on the technology side. So what Simply Blue is doing is we're looking at a semi-closed system rather than a net system. So currently the aquaculture farms in the UK, um, you've got a net, the net based system that allows, unfortunately, disease and feces to 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 move between the wild and the um, and the, the farm setting. So this this impacts both sides of, of the net, your your wild fish. Uh, end up contracting the likes of uh, you know any of the diseases built up on the farm and then sea lice can pass into and out of the uh, the farm so the the fish within it get get uh, you know get sick get get hurt and uh, as well and the damages the, the native the native species in the area and um, so what we propose with the semi-closed is that it's actually a sealed environment it's a controlled environment so we basically input the oxygen and the water we remove i believe it's a 99 or higher percent of the um, of the feces so a lot of the a lot of them a lot of the muck comes back out as actually reuses a byproduct um, I believe it's in some form of fertilization um, and then um, yeah so so this 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 creates a barrier prevents the transmission of disease between the the native um, species the wild species and the um, uh, the, the, the the farm species so uh, that is as far as I understand the, the high level uh, description that we've we, we've got from our own agriculture team so um we hopefully been, that kind of if, if it was something sorry to cut you off Arthur, yes, just say if it's something that you're particularly interested in happy to make an introduction to our teams um on that side who uh, clearly know more than than Alfie and i with our floating wind hats on no thanks a lot for answering Alfie. no worries Bye, josh cool so i think that's probably um Good point to end it, let you um, guys get away. But um, thank you so much to everyone who's attended and especially to everyone who's asked a question. Um, and thank you so much to Alfie and Kerry. Um, really insightful uh, presentation into what, yeah, I think is probably one of the biggest um, opportunities for Cornwall and generally the UK.